Welcome to the Magical Mommy Monday podcast. I'm Angela Dahlgren. I'm Jen Snyder, and we're two moms raised on Disney magic, figuring out parenthood one day, one meltdown, and one pandemic at a time. We hope you enjoyed this brand new episode. What a smug picture. <laughs> I'm just playing. What? That's the smile that you would make when you knew you were making Andy mad and you would switch your order when you were ordering dinner to what he was ordering <laughs> because you knew partially because it sounded better than what you had ordered, but partially because you knew it'd make him mad. That's what he would do. Every time we go out to dinner, my brother Andy would order, Jeff would order first. My brother Andy would order and every time Jeff would switch his order to what Andy was getting. Andy got so True. mad every time. He made it sound good. What can I say? Yeah. All right. I need to know the order. I know Angela's the baby, of course, but in terms of the brothers, where do you fall? I'm the tallest. Sure. Right. Um, and that's, that uh, that's that's it. Yeah, I, I believe that. And so, in terms of brothers, that's the show. Uh, so, so, yeah. yeah. Do, do you, me, do you, I mean, I guess. Show. I it's guess your I show. Go ahead. I guess, no, I mean, I guess I talk 90 percent of the time. Uh, you go ahead. I mean, oh, I asked an interview, interview question um, and I expect an answer. So if that could so, happen, that'd be great. Well, well, if you're going to talk 90 percent, I know it's an Ellen DeGeneres kind of interview here. <laughs> just gonna... Where she asks and she answers. <laughs> That's the joke, Angela. Thanks for <laughs> explaining it to your viewers. <laughs> Well, they're not watching. They're listening. <laughs> you see why that's funny is because Ellen DeGeneres <laughs> is culturally known on television in the United States. I already regret this podcast because um, it's going to get crushed the whole time. So four children. Oh, so Joe's the oldest. Yeah. Um, Andy, then, who's mm -hmm. born in 81, 82. Two. Then I'm third and the tallest. Mm -hmm. And then Angela is the youngest and the shortest. The baby. Nice. Um, who is the principal brother? The middle one, Andy. Oh, Andy. the principal. Like in a sense, like the patriarchally, <laughs> like who's like the predominant principal I mean, brother? That's a separate yeah. question, but I would like the answer okay. to that one too. You know, mm -hmm. he yeah. might be. <laughs> He's the gatherer. And I'm the hunter. Uh let's <laughs> see. <Giggity. laughs> Let me no. So yeah, Andy's the principal. Uh congratulations, recently Catholic school principal. Yeah. Yeah. Now he's gonna have no excuse not to go to church on Sundays because the reputation's on the line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and that's getting five kids ready in the morning. <laughs> Jesus, take that. the wheel. Mm -hmm. I can barely get myself ready in the morning. And I work from home. <laughs> I know. I just wear shorts all the time. And um, what, wait, I still yeah. have more questions. Sorry, okay. I'm still doing a yeah. deep dive here. Um, yeah. I'm, because I hear about brothers, right? But none of the brothers really have <laughs> names. So I, so I oh. know, and we okay. can edit this out if you want, but I sure. know. There's a COVID specialist New York brother. There's the teacher brother. Mm -hmm. Actually, Wait, that's you, the only two. Now, how do you describe me as a, oh, and then I have the divorced brother. Is that how I'm going to be <laughs> known? Leftover. I mean, maybe, maybe after this episode, uh, but he's I don't the, know. Uh, you know, he's the, he, he's, you know, brother. That, he's finding his way, uh, right? No, I, I describe you as the touring plans brother. I always say he's the one who did the touring yes. plans videos. Oh, yes. okay. That is an accurate mm -hmm. description. I feel like yeah. the other two are mentioned more often just because of school and our COVID environment. So that's probably why. Sure. Actually, I kind of apology. just started mentioning Andy because of that reason. Mainly but he's I'm like, also yeah. been featured on our TikTok. So. Oh, yeah. Did you know that? Andy, Andy's been. <laughs> Jen, wearing, did you like, know that? I did. did I put him on I, there. I made, I didn't know how to use TikTok. <laughs> so I made her upload them. Yeah. I'll have to send those to you. Andy has made some TikToks for us, which was mm -hmm. really him sending me videos and then just uploading him and telling him <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> You know, once he sends it, it's out there. You know, he has no control over that. Him, him wearing a dinosaur mask with Whitney Houston's song, singing along to it. I mean, yeah, totally. yeah that's, a, that's the principal brother right there. Yeah, that's for the public. Yeah, right. Or like, or, or for Christmas, he'll put on like a Buddy the Elf costume and wave to the kids. Oh, yeah. That's, that's good We're going to need footage of that this Christmas. I was disappointed there was no outline for this episode, Angela. I know. I, aren't I doing so well? You are. I'm going, so proud of you. Going off the cuff. I'm so, so proud of you. I'm, a, I'm an open book. Okay. But they, they have, I'll be honest, they've been a little meandering the questions. I mean, no expectations from me, you know? <laughs> okay. They've been on a podcast. You know what? You know what? Let's, let's do the intro. Let's okay. do the intro. Okay. Welcome to the Magical Mommy Monday podcast. I'm Angela Dahlgren here with my co-host, Jen Snyder. Hello. Last week, we spoke with Floor 
Bromley, and she just came out with her third album, which was called Pachamama. So if you have not listened to that podcast, please do so after this one. Today, we have someone who you might have seen back during my touring plans video days. He made an appearance, which I I think on three different videos, we have my brother Jeff on the show. I feel like we should have like an applause track. Yeah. Yay, Yay, Jeff. Yay. Yay. Thanks for having me. Jeff, happy, to, happy to be here. Jeff. Well, gosh, you haven't seen him for about two years. I mean, a lot has been going on with him. So Mm -hmm. we are just going to talk to him about life and um, life as a newly single dad. And we are just going to jump right in with these questions. (laughs) Was this the part where you said you didn't have questions? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. First podcast, and this this is is what I get. Practice for Angela. We're just going to have a dialogue. And especially after, you know, I got to follow up after the Pachi Mama lady. Pachi Mama. <laughs> third, yeah. third release. I mean, release he didn't exactly, you know, win any awards for his voice, but, you know, he did That's raise two girls. Mm-hmm. And in fact, I'm still raising them. So I'm doing pretty oh, good. They so could far. win awards. Yeah. How yeah. old are your girls? Uh, my girls are seven and nine years old. So I got to, I'm going to have a fourth So you're pretty grader, much done raising seven. them. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, actually, uh, they're outside uh, mowing the grass. <laughs> Over there. All right. This hey, is I'm, spot. I'm, I'm at the window. I got a bay window because I work from home. So I got to sit at my work desk. Got my three monitors here. Nice. I got my cup of coffee. Oh, no, that was this morning. Now I have my scotch. You know, just enjoying <laughs> after yeah. work hours. He has a very nice. good view. It's like up the street. I, I digress. Anyway, there's no really good way to start this. So I'm just going to jump right in. <laughs> So Jeff, over the past year, you have going, you've been going through the process of getting a divorce. And I mean, it's really something that no one thinks going into marriage that they're going to have to go through one day, but, um, you have, so feel free to, you know, open up as much as you want. But, um, that process started last November, was it? Yeah, that's when I approached my spouse and let her know after well it had been years of uncertainty and this doubt and kind of shoving those thoughts and feelings aside like that's not what you're supposed to do you were raised catholic you know so you gotta you know you made a commitment type thing but it was in november where you know i had written a letter that i had read to her and uh and then we tried two months living together in the same house during covid and that actually yeah about two months it didn't didn't work great Mm -hmm. didn't work great and so then Mm -hmm. January moved out and then uh you know it's funny I thought when you get divorced or when I would get divorced once it was like okay this is actually happening which was by far the scariest thing I've ever done was that "Eh, it's going to be a a couple months you know we'll wrap things up the judge will get do the little judgy stamp with the gavel or whatever they do but then I learned online that the average divorce process is nine months and I was like no way and then here we are in July, finishing it up nine months. Mm-hmm. And uh, it feels like so much has happened in that time. Yeah. And there's been definitely some stressful times for you and overwhelming and just kind of hanging on until things are wrapped up. Um, do you feel like COVID kind of exacerbated things or do you feel like it would have happened regardless? That's a good question. I think COVID definitely played a part. Um, you know, I was, uh, I've been working from home since last March, 2020. Mm-hmm. And then we made the decision to homeschool our girls or not homeschool distance learning. Right. Mm-hmm. And so then my, my ex spouse who was working like 0.5.6, you know, suggested that I should go supplemental and then I'll just do the distance learning with the kids. So everybody was home every day. And so I think, you know, with the stress of COVID and then being isolated like that, I think it did exacerbate, you know, some of those foundational issues that were already there. Mm -hmm. Um, And for me, I think it wasn't a great experience coming to the developing these insights, but, you know, it really, hmm. I think, you know, I'll probably be all over with this if that's all right with you too. That's fine. Because I'm still like developing insights now, nine months later. Um, you know, I, for the longest time, I knew that there was some disconnect, but 
but um, you know, I, I felt like there was this, I don't, can't put my finger on what doesn't feel right in this relationship, but something doesn't feel right. And I think the COVID and having more tension allowed for more conflict. And through that conflict, I realized that that disconnect I felt was that both parties weren't coming to the table 50, 50. And it was, you know, I think the crux of it for me was that to be able to have a successful partnership, and this is just my opinion, I'm not a marriage counselor or anything, but I believe that you have to be willing to hold your partner accountable and also hold yourself accountable for your actions and behaviors, you know, because we can feel what we feel. You know, we might say things we don't mean in the moment, in the heat of an argument, but there has to be this way to come back and repair that and heal that damage that might be done. Um, and some people maybe have big blowups. Um, some people have little ones over time. And I think mine was a mix of both. And, you know, having this counseling background, I kept thinking, I have the skill set to figure this out. And I would try over the years, I felt like I've tried this intervention and that. And, you know, maybe if I ask, what would be a way that I can approach you with these types of concerns I have that will make you feel more open to that? And then trying those and then them not working. I just realized, and I think maybe this connects to, you know, where I am spiritually as well as that, you know, this is for me, this is the one life I have to live. And I've spent so much of that time setting aside my own happiness and, you know, to make sure that, you know, just everyone else around me is happy. And so COVID made me realize I'm giving and giving and giving and it's not fixing things and I'm getting less and less happy. And I started to realize, I noticed my, my nine-year-old started to adapt her behavior based on the moods of her mother and I. And when I, that was one of those things I was like, okay, I'm not going to let this start to influence her life. Because mm -hmm. I know, you know, these things, you know, think about my, our parents, Angela, growing up and, you know, you'd be sensitive during certain situations, you know, mm -hmm. our, our father is a great, generous, wonderful man, but he would bring stress home from work and there would be expectations and you would just try to adapt to those. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I think a part of that is, you know, from how I grew up to the marriage I was in, um, it was pleasing others. And at some point I just completely stopped thinking about, well, what pleases Jeff? So with, with all that rambling there, um, the past, well, really the past seven months, once we separated was now both exciting and terrifying because I knew who I was in high school, but in high school, you're still trying to figure out who you are. And I thought I knew who I was in this marriage, but who I became the person I developed into, which is crazy. You grow up as an adult with this person. So how you learn to relate to people is also as part of this, this dynamic with this other person. And if there's unhealthy parts of that, like I saw, there's been a lot of self-doubt because I've developed unhealthy ways to relate to others through this. I don't know if that, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So the past, uh, you know, half a year has been really interesting, but still there's those moments where I don't, I'm not a good friend to myself you know, and I hold myself to expectations and I talk negatively to myself in ways that I would never talk to a friend, mm -hmm. you know, so it's been trying to be offer myself more grace as a man, as a son, as a father, you know, and just trying to do that next right thing to be healthier for myself and for my girls and, and for whatever the future holds. Yeah. I think it's also it hasn't been that long. Mm -mm. I mean, it, everything in 2020 and 2021 feels like 10 extra years, I think. But in yeah. reality, from you having this talk to now is only nine months, which is <laughs> so, not even a year. I mean, so you should not have all the answers or know everything at this point or have it all figured out. And I don't know that you will for a while. I mean, that's nice to hear. That's, that's, that's good. That normalizes things because, yeah. uh, you know, because when you're in it, it's hard to see that. Like you feel like you're in it. This has been going on a while. So. Yeah. And, yeah. and, uh, in the marriage, 
and this is just my perception, my ex-wife might have a different perception and that's completely valid as well. Um, but uh, in that spending so much time, you know, being that rock for everybody and learning slowly over 12 years that you can't be responsible for someone else's happiness. Uh, it was 12 years and then 14 years of knowing each other, but over the 12 years of the marriage, it was, you have to be the one that's the steady one. You, you know, you have to continue to work hard in your job and advance in your career. Cause what you're saying is that there's inconsistency or uncertainty with what they feel about their work and their career trajectory. So now I suppose, um, as you guys are talking about giving myself some of that, all right, it's been nine months. I'm just now realizing that I am still holding this mindset that you need to be on, you need to be the rock. You need to be, you have your shit together. Mm -hmm. Um, even though I don't know what the next step I'm supposed to be taking is. Right. And I have some people that are already talking to me about dating. Dating's healthy. You should be doing that. And I'm, I'm not there at all. And mm -hmm. I'm actually afraid of it. And I don't know what I want. I know what I don't want, but I'm fearful. I, I don't have that assurance of myself to know that I'm not going to go find someone unconsciously that's just like that last person because that's right. not what I want. And I know mm -hmm. where that can lead me. And so it has been nine months and I'm still figuring out who I am again mm -hmm. or who I am now as an adult. You know, I'm not the same kid I was as a teenager. Well, I'm still a dumbass sometimes. So maybe I'm a little <laughs> like him, <laughs> but I can uh, that. <laughs> so it is this internal struggle. And, you know, you, I can sit here and catch myself in that negative self-talk and not even realize it was going on, how long it had been going on. Um, and I think that's where having like getting reconnected with people that I didn't prioritize in while I was married, like my family, mm -hmm. there are always reasons not to, to get together with my family. Mm -hmm. um, even friends, you know, it'd have to become a choice between friends and a lot of guilt or to taking care and keeping the family happy. Right. You know, I think that just from what we've talked about, you and me, um, for a long time, because of the inconsistencies and just, I don't know how to explain it, but anyway, because of those lack of consistencies, you kind of worked, what is it? Live to work, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. And for, I... the first, mm -hmm. for the first time and, and career, very career oriented. And now you're in this place where, yeah, you have a job that you are really happy with. You have a new job. That's great. But now you get to work to live and find out who you are, you know, what your hobbies are, because you're not spending all of this extra time having to make sure that the needs of others are satisfied. Like you kind of lost yourself a little bit. And I've seen more of who you are at your core. Mm. And it was like a six month evolution that was huge. And that's, I mean, it was really nice. Because you, it was so, taking up so much of your energy. Yeah, I, I hadn't realized that. Um, yeah. And it's funny that uh, you're noticing that work to live and now the, because I've only felt that in the past month and a half. Um, mm -hmm. Even in the beginning of the divorces, I was thinking, I need to, I need to get a leadership role in the next six months. Uh, I need to, and that has been for the past few years, I need to get into a leadership role at Mayo Clinic. And, you know, my reputation at my identity and my career is going to define me and make me good enough. Um, but yeah, for the past month and a half, having this, not feeling that, that burden, um, or just, you know, what it was, I don't want to put too many negative connotations on that relationship, but, um, for yeah, you. Mm -hmm. it, it is right for me. Like, uh, I, I have more mental capacity. I'm not, I, it, I don't know if others that have gone through a divorce can relate of your listeners, but I, you know, I, to keep the status quo, which was balance and happiness. I had to numb a part of myself and push those things down. Um, because if I allowed myself to feel that unhappiness and recognize those long periods without joy, except for my girls, they bring me joy every day. So that's not, but you know, these things where I think, you know, oh, I'm 10 years in a marriage or I'm in my mid thirties, I feel like I should you know, know myself better, but I would feel doubts. Um, so yeah, it's been great. Um, and 
I don't feel this pressure to be a leader anymore. In fact, I'm not sure if I ever want to go a leadership route because there's so much more to life to enjoy that. Why would I want to commit more time and stress to that? Right. Do you think you were in that mindset going back to how you felt like you were the rock? You're not allowed to really feel your emotions. You're not. So if you're now a leader in a role, that's kind of playing that same part, right? So you're kind of just transferring that energy. Whoa. <laughs> She has a lot of these. See? So smart. It's like every other day there's Hi. a new insight. Wow. Hmm. So maybe in some ways there has been some progress. And I've never, I've never thought about like that. But and now yeah. that you're letting go of that idea, it's because you're kind of going, oh, wait, maybe I can kind of take this other journey and this other route and figure out who I am. That's not the rock that doesn't have to be on all the time that, you know, is allowed to feel. Yeah. Like you're the leader in a social circle. Like you're the person that people want to be around and have fun with. You don't have to be the leader at work. You can just work to live and travel and have fun and go see friends who live in different States and but not rock climb girls. again. <laughs> oh, we got to tell that story. Having a panic attack 30 feet in the air. <laughs> It was you did so well though. And my Jen, I'm trying stay, to my hands were sweating so much on that I'm wall. Trying... It was so hard to grasp those rocks. I'm trying to convince him to bring his girls to Disney with us next yes. next winter. Yes, for sure. You have I think to. he's gonna do it. Yes. But yeah, um, my next question is as you I... think of it right now. To talk no, to you actually, <laughs> I've had two and I've been panicking that I'm going to forget both of them. I've my been writing first... things down oh, along the that's way. so no. smart. I got to do that. Um, my first one is, um, how, did you ever express your personal unhappiness? In my marriage? Yeah, to your spouse. Yeah, I did. And, um, You know, it's so funny because we've had conversations and they've, through this divorce process, they have been stressful because, you know, when I, in November, when I read this letter, you know, I thought it wasn't a surprise that this was, we kind of both see this, but it's not how it's perceived. So, you know, a lot of the past eight, nine months have been her expressing a lot of hurt and anger at me which again, because of my role through this process, I've, I've accepted that and kind of found a way to cope with it. Um, I'm trying to think of what your question was, but it's, uh, you know, it's funny because I, there are moments where I feel like I have the right to feel so angry myself um, because, you know, I, I, I felt like I tried my best and it wasn't reciprocated over 12 years. And now it's because I'm the one that, unilaterally made that decision I'm the bad guy in it mm -hmm. um so what sorry what was the question uh, <laughs> did you did you express your unhappiness and did things change or what was the response I, you know I I think honestly I expressed my unhappiness more in the first six seven eight years than I did in the last four um and I'll take responsibility for that is do you think you grew complacent or like it wouldn't change anything? I, I was losing hope that things could improve, um, you know, because when you don't always feel safe in any kind of relationship, you know, in the workplace, at home with a friend, you know, when that safety isn't there, it's hard to make yourself vulnerable. It's hard to put yourself out there. And I felt like, I was doing the same, you know, insanity, doing the thing over and over again, expecting different results. And I would make myself vulnerable and share these concerns and these feelings, you know, hoping that this is the time we're going to be able to come together. And I'm sharing my parts in this, you know, and I'm, I'm willing to hear, you know, if you can say, yeah, those are your parts and this as well. But then you also hope the other person's going to recognize their part. And then it's, I think when you can both do that and there's that, complete honesty, then you can start working together forward. Um, but I didn't get that. And I began to feel, um, you know, and our perception is of what happened in memories, whatnot, but I began to feel like making myself vulnerable was opening up to more hurts. 
Um, you know, with the whole counseling background, why I got into that is because I've always been a very empathic person and I'm curious about people. And so to ever have strong enough feelings to say something like, I hate you, for me to feel that way enough to say it or say other things that are very strong, um, I, I just can't imagine ever feeling that way or those strong enough feelings to say that to somebody. But, so then to hear some things like that, um, you know, I'm, of course, applying my own experience. So they'd just be gut-wrenching, heart-wrenching. And uh, so, yeah, I think I expressed my concerns. And about a year before the actual like, November, we were sitting out in the car before I, outside of a Christmas party. And it was like all cards on the deck. I can't keep doing this. If things continue the way they are, I, I'm going to ask for a divorce. And, and so COVID certainly didn't help. But the ultimate, uh, I think the ultimate decider for me was I just had lost hope that that person would ever be able to change because I felt it would, change would um, threaten the core part of who they were. You know, to admit that much responsibility was maybe too much. And so I don't blame them. I mean, because we all grow up with these core parts of who we are that can, you know, maybe we don't like to talk about them. We like to, don't like to acknowledge them, but it, that was too much for me. I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't continue living in that feeling happy or feeling that's okay for my daughters. You know, and that's, that was kind of it. It's, I don't think this person's going to change right or wrong. I don't feel that. So am I willing to accept this and the consequences that'll come for it? Am I willing to make a change? And, you know, and kind of, I rode that fence for a couple of years because that kind of change, a divorce, going against what's expected of you from your upbringing, from your family, mm -hmm. from the friends who you've always presented a, a really great face to, who would never expect, who never expected there was anything wrong inside the home. That was terrifying. But I, I guess just the, uh, the uh, pain outweighed the discomfort of making the change. You said you didn't ever feel um, the shared responsibility along the way. Do you think in the last nine months, have you felt any of that? Ha has there been any realizations or things shared with you from your ex that are like, you know what, I know I played a part in this too, or I'm sorry for the part I played in this or anything like that? You know, I think in that first few weeks when there was so much chaotic emotions for both of us mm -hmm. and fear and, you know, something that significant, something that severe life changing of a mm -hmm. divorce, I think does make a person think. And so there was some of that then. Um, but I think over the past seven, eight months, that need to protect that core part mm -hmm. um, took over. And so um, I don't know if that person will ever, maybe in, in moments by themselves, mm -hmm. they may. Uh, uh, but I don't know if they'll ever share that with me right. or consciously acknowledge that. Um, and I've accepted that. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I love her like I love a good friend or family and as a mother of my children. Mm -hmm. And I will support her however I can in ways as long as they don't, um, you know, um, challenge the integrity of these boundaries I've established. Mm -hmm. It's been hard for you to kind of set those boundaries because, and I think that would be hard for anyone going through a divorce. You know, you become, your sp uh, spouses become caretakers for each other. So there are certain things that you do for your spouse, whether that be, you know, pick them up dinner or take care of them when they're sick that, you know, when you're divorced, you just kind of have to unlearn. I'm just giving examples, the ones I provided. Um, and there are things that you've been kind of conditioned to do. Like I take the recycling and put it right outside of the, you know, mud door. What is it? Mud room door. And my husband knows that he has to bring it out into the recycling bin. So those kind of things that you have to unlearn. And that's kind of been different for you over the past few months is kind of unlearning and setting new boundaries if that yeah. makes any sense no it does I think the one of those so it's so funny is and maybe you know maybe again folks that have been in a long-term relationship or people that have been married or even people that are married well no I, I think you have to end that relationship to maybe well maybe I don't know what I'm talking about but for me anyway people like you Angela or one of my sister-in-laws they've shared things with me 
that are so simple in logic, so straightforward, but I feel like I just got slapped upside the head. Like mm -hmm. what? That, like, I think you two answered at one point and told me, you don't owe her anything anymore. You don't owe that explanation why you're making this decision to set this boundary. You don't owe that explanation why you disagree with that decision that she's wanting you to make or whatever it is. And that was just so crazy to hear uh, because I, I you know, one of those patterns that we grew up together developing the dynamic was I have to have a rationale for what I'm feeling or for why I don't agree with this or uh, it was it was very strange and there's been a number of those kind of upside the head slap uh, moments that have helped a lot in this process. I don't know that you want to get into this we don't have to um but all right since, so the sex life right well, oh, right, <laughs> right that was my next question was actually one i wasn't gonna get into let um, me share that with my sister okay yeah, love hearing about that <laughs> um what i was gonna ask is since this is somewhat of a parenting podcast or we pretend it to be um can you speak to the kids reactions or how they're doing at this point how they were doing in the beginning if you don't want to talk about it at all, that's fine too. Up to you. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it. I think, well, clearly talking about this is helpful for me because mm -hmm. even today I've had some realizations with that connection with the career and being the, the rock and the person. Good job, um, Jen. Thanks so much. Let it go, Jen. <laughs> I'll send this, you my copay after. This is, a, <laughs> this is a great parenting podcast. I want you to listen to this. We should be um, monetized with ads. Go oh, Jen. <laughs> So let's see. So the girls, wow, gosh, yeah, because it's been within the year still. They're still seven and nine and uh, read a lot online about, you know, communication with the kids and, mm -hmm. you know, you don't want them to feel it's their fault because kids are very good at picking up parental emotions, right? They can understand, maybe not even put it in the word, but understand there's emotion, what that is, mm -hmm. but they don't have that cognitive context to understand why. And so because children are egocentric because that's developmentally appropriate, then they reflect internally. And why is mom feeling this? Because I did something wrong. Why does daddy seem tense or irritable today? Maybe it's because I didn't clean up my room or you know, I didn't do something good enough. And so I wanted to make sure that as best as I can control, which I've realized is not a lot in life, but as best as my interactions with them is that they never felt that. And I give my spouse a lot of credit. I think she was really on the same page. And in fact, one of the most positive things out of this has been, we can have maybe some disagreement or some issues between us and tension, but I think as a co-parent, she's gonna be wonderful. Um, and I think that's the best thing that can come out of this for both of us and for our girls. Um, with this transition to separation, um, I think those kids are more resilient than we were. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they went from each having their own bedroom, really nice rooms, you know, laid out one in the bunk mm -hmm. bed, one had like kind of the princess canopy <laughs> thing to then coming to daddy's and they have to share a room. Mm -hmm. It's much smaller and one can't open a dresser without the other having to close theirs. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, they've, they've made it work. And, mm -hmm. you know, I probably check in with them too much on how they're feeling. And, you know, each kid has a different personality. So one, you can see her thinking, but if you ask too much about it, she's not, just nothing, nothing. But mm -hmm. if you allow mm -hmm. space, um, she'll ask, start asking those questions and it can lead to a conversation where the other doesn't like talking about feelings as much, but she expresses those needs uh, through physical affection, like coming up and asking for a hug or wanting to sit by me, you know, holding hands, which is mm -hmm. so freaking adorable. <laughs> um, uh, so I'm really hopeful. Uh, I think they've handled it really well. They have, and you've done a really great job setting, you know, rules for daddy's house, like, um, and, and chores for them, whether that be helping set the table or clear the table or keeping their rooms clean, <laughs> your youngest making her bed every morning, which I just think is like hilarious because she does such a good job and I can't <laughs> get my kids to make their beds at all. And I think you've done a really good job with that. 
you know, going for walks around your, your lake. That's, well, that's been fun watching you do. The, the, you know, one of these interesting things is, I mean, and there's these transitions when I moved here, both for the girls and I, and then for myself was that these routines, these new habits, they're not going to develop on their own. I have to consciously make it happen, mm -hmm. which is, I think something that that's where one thing I relied on my spouse is she was more focused on the home. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I only realized once I moved out that my youngest gets so many damn stains on her shirts. It's crazy. <laughs> I've gone through a whole bottle of that stain remover, that resolve spray. Um, and, you know, even doing laundry. I mean, I would have gladly done laundry, but no, I'm, I don't want you to do laundry. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, so now I'm doing laundry and, um, you know, making sure the dishes are done, the kitchen's clean and the bathroom's clean. Um, and so, you know, not perfect. It has been developing new habits, which takes time, but it's so funny. It's, it's much more gratifying to do chores in this house. Um, it's more gratifying to sit around the dinner table with the girls from then the meal we, we all helped prepare. Mm -hmm. um, it's more gratifying to be with them in general. I'm more present with them than I think I ever was. Not, mm -hmm. I don't, again, I don't think I was a bad dad. Um, but, you know, when you're in this flow of these routines as a family, a family unit, it's, um, you know, get home from work, we do the family stuff, and all of a sudden I go into bed and mm -hmm. you know, do the, repeat the same thing. Well, now that we split time, we have a, um, the week goes two, two, three. So two days with one spouse, two days with me. And then we rotate the three day weekend. Mm -hmm. um, and so by the time I have them, if it's been that five long five day week for them, I'm like rubbing my hands together. I'm looking around. What are, what are we going to do? You know, I got all the good snacks here. We got blueberries <laughs> and strawberries. We're definitely going to go to that park across the street. Um, so, I mean, that's been a blessing is, um, going from thinking this is the rest of my life i'm gonna grow old with these person this person mm -hmm. i'm gonna work it together we're gonna see our girls go off to college or do what they're passionate about we're gonna have grandkids that are going to come to our house to then having to grieve the loss of that mm -hmm. and then having to acknowledge that now i don't want know what that future looks like mm -hmm. it it really is uh, i i appreciate every moment and i try to take things more I try to be more present in the moment because I'm, I can't worry about what the future might look like. Um, oh. But I know I can keep them happy today and be a good dad today. Mm -hmm. Some days there's frozen pizzas involved, but <laughs> you know, that's how it goes. Yeah. That's anyone's situation. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I think you're, you have a huge weight lifted off of you too. And because well, I'm of on that, watchers, so well, we'll get there. Well, I didn't want to get into all that, but um... <laughs> you don't want to see the inner tube. Don't let me stand up here. <laughs> Um, but because you have this, you've lifted so much off of your plate mentally and emotionally that there's space now to be present and there's space to enjoy your life more speaking to what Angela was saying earlier with the work to live versus live to work. You're able to enjoy the little moments more and take it all in more because there's space for it when you're in a home and it's tense and it's uncomfortable and you don't know what you think you have a plan in your head, but it's not what you want. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to embrace that life, you know, as much as you're like, yep, we were going to do this. We're raising these kids. We're taking them to college. Here's the whole plan. I see it all. You're yeah. not embracing that because it's not really where you wanted to be as, yeah. as a bigger thing, not with your kids, of course, but you know, you know now I, there's space for it. And, you know, and I realized, uh, you know, along this lines of, you know, being more present and uh, having to now, you know, pay attention to my wellness is um, for myself and for my girls is, you know, being so disconnected from everything, you know, maybe intentionally at times to feel like I'm protecting myself. Um, now to be more open, it also floods the, it opens the floodgates to acknowledging these unhealthy mental coping skills or, mm -hmm. you know, these there are many of nights I didn't, I always considered myself a night owl over the past decade. And the reason for that is because I didn't get alone time 
which is important to me. And I didn't really realize that because it had to be together time. And if it wasn't, I wanted to do something different. I'd have a reason for it. And if it wasn't a good enough reason, then there's something wrong. It's like, no, I, sometimes I just want to be on my freaking own. <laughs> and so I would find myself staying up to one, two in the morning just to play a stupid football video game, mm -hmm. but having that alone time. And so, you know, it's funny now, I feel like an old man because I'm going to bed at like nine o'clock, nine thirty. Oh my gosh, me too. <laughs> well, you are an old man. Yeah. I, 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 I go to bed here. so early now. <laughs> but um, you know, it was. I, I, I'm finding now that I'm getting that Jeff time I need after the girls go to bed, um, and I don't need to do things that are escapism type behaviors. Mm -hmm. I'm not like well, it's maybe more in the past few months because the isolation early on that was tough, the loneliness, especially when the girls weren't with me. Um, I did try to fill that, but lately it's, you know, it's, you can do a little bit of something you enjoy, like playing games or reading a good book in moderation, get that alone time, acknowledge it, way to go. You know, you're doing something for you, doing something for yourself and then going to bed and waking up feeling, you know, better. Um, I know about myself. One thing that was hard to admit is, especially when I felt like staying up with my own coping skill is when I don't get good sleep, I have symptoms of depression the next day. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's a dim outlook on everything, you know, that negative self-talk imposter syndrome at work and kick in. Um, I don't feel those things as strongly today. Mm. What your, your place, your house that you're currently living in, it's, it's not big by any means, but it's yours and you get to decide, you get to decide what goes in it and you get to take care of it. And it's been, it's just been really fun, you know, helping you organize it and being like, oh, get this vacuum so that the girls can help you vacuum up the crumbs. Or uh, you sent <laughs> sent a picture of your, your shrimp. Was it Alfredo? Is that it what it was? It said a chini shrimp pesto. <laughs> I mean, Don't you make Alfredo with pesto? <laughs> okay, I can do what I go. want, Angela. I, I was I'm my own man. Damn the you. whole point of this podcast. Sorry, I'm sorry. You, your fettuccine shrimp pesto looked delicious, but before, you know, um, it was, you weren't doing as much cooking. It was just kind right. of like cheese and crackers for dinner, but you've really come into your own with taking care of your surroundings and making proper meals for yourself and just treating yourself better, taking care of yourself and self-care and everything and not feeling shame around that because we shouldn't, we shouldn't break promises to ourselves. And like you said, we shouldn't talk to ourselves how we wouldn't talk to a friend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think those first five months, I was keeping the uh, local grocery store float just on the amount of deli meat I was buying for all my sandwiches I was eating, <laughs> three meals, two meals a day. Um, I do have another question. I feel like it's yeah. only fair Shoot. to talk about maybe where the blame is on your side. Mm -hmm. I agree. So that's the question. <laughs> All right. So the, so the question is where, did, where, what was my part in it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I didn't do anything wrong. No, <laughs> I'm, no I'm, I'm kidding. I'm I have kidding. no flaws. <laughs> you know, there was a moment a few months ago when she did tell me that um, there was, you know, there's your circle and then the partner's circle and that overlapping circle. And I, I, I think I was a little defensive in the moment having, you know, a moment that day where, She's like, you didn't allow yourself to express your emotions in that shared circle. You kept those only in your circle. And I, I think, I think there, that's, that's true. Um, I know as the marriage progressed, that became more and more true. But e even thinking back, um, I know I struggle with feelings of self-worth and even going back to childhood. And so I don't know how it develops. I'm not going to do psychoanalysis to figure that out, but um, how I accept myself is based on how others accept me. And I, that's a flaw I want to work on where a growth area. And so I think my part, a piece of my part was not expressing myself for fear of that not being accepted, being rejected, and therefore rejecting myself or feeling self, low self-worth. Um, and so that was my own anxiety and insecurity that kept me from extending more of myself in the partnership. Do you feel like um, not doing marriage counseling sooner 
do you feel like that was maybe something that you could have done or maybe you initiated things before it was maybe too late to get to that point? Yeah. You know, and it's, it's a question. It's a, I think it's a question everyone that goes through this is going to ask is, did I do enough? Did I, was it, did I do enough too late? Um, I think there was an opportunity to do marriage counseling. I don't know if it would have changed the outcome. Um, but I think part of that was some of my hubris with this mental health background that I should be able to fix this because I've been fixing so many things in this, again, from my perception of keeping everyone happy that I should have the answer. And to go to someone else for that is acknowledging I can't do this on my own. Mm -hmm. Um, So in hindsight, I think it would have, you know, even if it would have helped make that process smoother for us, because, you know, again, when she felt blindsided by it, um, you know, it really made it these past nine months difficult for both of us Mm -hmm. um, because she didn't have an opportunity. You know, I took away that control from her, which would be really hard. Because we went into that it's as a mutual decision at marriage. To not feel like it was a mutual decision to leave wouldn't feel good. Um, so I think perhaps doing the counseling, if it was from this perspective, I guess at the end. So at the end, if we would have done it with the expectation that this could help us transition out of this marriage, then I, I would have pursued it. Um, that's not what she wanted. She wanted to pursue it to recover the marriage. And at that point, because it was perhaps too late, um, I felt I would have been inauthentic going into a re- relationship counseling to try to repair a relationship I just didn't feel was right for me anymore. Right. It would have almost been leading her on at that point. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I don't think people are, are going into this asking, did you do enough? I think, you know, as far as the marriage counseling question, maybe that's something that other people are considering. And there's this I mean, I, it's a great, it's from Grey's Anatomy. Okay. It's Obviously. like people go to marriage counseling for two reasons. And it's because either both people want to work on the marriage or one person needs help telling the other person that they want out. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like maybe in your case, if you would have pursued that option, it would have been you just needing the help telling her, but in the end you did it on your own. <laughs> um, I have an assumption that will lead to a question. Um, So from what I'm gathering, talking to you, I would think or assume that you would have been worried about the reaction of your family and friends. And you've kind of mentioned your upbringing and this is what you're supposed to do and worried about judgments or, you know, just negative reactions or losing family and friends over this. So one, Am I correct in saying that? And two, if so, was the reality not as bad as what you had set up in your mind? So one, your, your assumption is accurate. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, not only did I at that one at some point realize or feel that counseling was a failure for me internally, I felt like getting divorced would let people down, my mm-hmm. family. Um, and, and again, part of that energy I expended and why I feel so you know, I feel I have so much energy these days is because I expended so much energy portraying a happy, well-balanced, healthy family. Um, and uh, so there are some people like some family members that when I did tell them they're like, Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I see it. I didn't think you're going to do it, but I can see it. Mm-hmm. Um, friends and acquaintances, blown away, surprised, mm-hmm. you know, wanting to know details, but being polite. Um, my parents who have since been some of my biggest supporters and, you know, being there for me, um, they were initially disappointed and told me that, mm-hmm. uh, that they were disappointed in me. You know, um, they're also cradle Catholics been married for 40 plus years and mm-hmm. both and of they, their parents. Them and their perfect are, life. <laughs> yes, four kids. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, but they since what well, I think it, it took my dad a little longer to come around, but um, both since have been very supportive to the point where my dad, who is not an animal person, let Jeff's three legged cat move in <laughs> to his house. Frankie. <laughs> Frankie. <laughs> dad, he hasn't pooped on the ground if you're listening. No, it just smells <laughs> a little bit like cat in that house. Uh, yeah. Uh, 
yeah, no, I, I think I think you're right, Jen. Um, and uh, it's you know it's it's funny. There have been moments in my life where I know I have this this issue with doubt and self worth and confidence. And, you know, most of that stuff is not rational. It's just how our minds are weird. Um, but there's always been this part, whether it was you know making a decision to no longer identify as Catholic or you know using humor to push boundaries uh, or being the, you know, the, the stinky little brother that mm-hmm. was wanting to rebel against mm-hmm. these expectations that were self-imposed or externally imposed. And so in a way for me, I don't know if this is going to sound cliche, but, you know, this asking for this divorce was, okay, this sounds, um, I don't mean this, you know, with all humility, when I say this, for me, I, I was very proud of myself when I did mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. Uh, because you finally you know, stood up for yourself. I did. Mm-hmm. I did. And I didn't know if I had that in me because this past 12 years I had deferred and I had, you know, just I'm not going to make an argument. I'm not, this isn't going to be a hill I'm going to uh, die on. And that's became the norm that I was losing myself and what was important to Jeff. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was this standing up for myself. And that gives me so much hope for not only, you know, the future that I can have happiness, um, but that one day I hope my girls might be able to understand a piece of that, Mm -hmm. you know, and not, not that I'm going to throw their mother under the bus. Cause again, I think she's going to, she's a great mom. She's going to be a great mom and they're smart kids and they're going to understand in time mom's flaws and dad's flaws. Cause that's, Mm -hmm. we grew up and we recognize that our parents are flawed as well. And we still love them and accept them. Mm -hmm. Um, So I hope that can be something for the girls that I can, I can share it because, you know, when I had girls, you know, I was like, shit, now I have girls that are entering this crazy world and that's really scary. And they're going to need to have strong voices. And then they're going to need to believe in themselves and be brave even when they're scared. Yeah. Um, so I hope that is something that the three of us are going to be able to explore together and build together. Well, thanks for talking to us today, Jeff. I hope you found this somewhat therapeutic. <laughs> yeah, this is great. And you're not even charging me. Wait, we'll you're see not you next me. week, same time or? Same yeah. time, six o'clock. You want to come right. back on the show sometime? Yeah, well, I got D&D at eight tonight. So oh, I'll... okay. Well, I wasn't oh, talking so... about today. So... Okay. Oh. Love to come back. Talk about <laughs> yeah. parenting. Um, All right. We're back with Jeff. Six month update here. Uh, do you want to <laughs> He lost tell... his children and his house. <laughs> <laughs> Things that could have gone better. Uh, do you want to tell people where they can find you on social media? Um, I got to look up. I got to look up my. In... Yeah, they can have my Instagram. I got to look up what my Instagram is. Jeff. Jeff has more of like a Bo Burnham type humor, I guess is the best way to compare it. <laughs> um, and he makes videos, videos, I guess. It's, uh, I found it. It's Jeffy Potts, J-E-F-F-Y-P-O-T-S. On Instagram. We will put that in the show notes. Yeah, totally. Yeah, put them in the notes. I'll start making more funny videos. Those are great yeah. outlets. You took like a three week hiatus and I've been waiting for you to make more. Yeah, but I've been sitting in my work chair for every single video. I need to <laughs> change up my environment. That's why you pull an Angela and put a background behind you so no one knows you're sitting in the same chair day after day. I, I need to have the confidence of an influencer on TikTok who can go out to the mall. I go to McDonald's drive through and just hold my phone at my face mm-hmm. and do something funny. I The only place I've done that outside of the theme parks is the mall of america people people stare otherwise oh you're probably a diamond dozen there then. yeah <laughs> no at the theme parks everyone's looking at their phones so it's not a big deal i'm gonna be you know popping squats in front of fountains and you know <laughs> taking those selfies i think that's a great totally. idea that, sh- mm-hmm. that should be your new thing Absolutely. dad you're embarrassing stop <laughs> yeah. i'm an influencer <laughs> so like you don't even know what that means <laughs> this is who i am now Yo, this burger is bussing, kids. <laughs> I don't even know the new terms anymore. Anyway. That means something's really good if it's bussing. Mm-hmm. Stick buzz- with me, kid. I'll help buzz- you out. Buzzing? Bussing. No, buzzing. No, not no. buzzing. B-U-S-S-I-N. I'm older than both of you, and I know that. My goodness. I can't. Bussing? Yes. I sound like mom. It's embarrassing. Mom's been on the podcast like two or three times. 
That's wow, his you guys, dad. You guys I are scraping the bottom of the barrel, huh? <laughs> oh my <laughs> you god! You got me on here now. I'm gonna have Joe do a segment, and I'm gonna see if we can make it out without him saying the f word. <laughs> yeah, just get on those editing skills. You'll be fine. <laughs> I know. I'm gonna edit that one. All right. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to give us a return a return a review on itunes if you want you can follow us on instagram at magical mommy mondays twitter at magic mom monday you can email us but honestly no one ever does um and i think that's all of our handles i hope you're having a great day night whatever you are doing and we'll talk to you next time Bye. bye bye thank you for listening to this episode of the magical mommy monday podcast you can find us on Instagram and Facebook at Magical Mommy Monday, on Twitter at Magic Mom Monday, or you can email us at Magical Mommy Mondays at gmail.com. The music you heard on this episode was produced by Matt Harvey. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time.